did you restore this place? Yeah, I did. It was really a, a wreck, and, and especially in the interior. I, mean, I the recently added, met up yeah, with Daryl Hall at the location of his latest passion, the, the a refurbished restaurant and I, I live music club named, simply house. enough, Daryl's House. Hall hosts the show from his new club, and as yeah, we sat down there to talk, the I realized that more than all the fame, Daryl Hall is first and foremost a musician's musician. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure. And I hope it'll be fun for you. Oh, yeah. Have you had any fun lately? Have I had any fun? I, well, if, if you want to call opening this club fun, I don't, I don't know if I'd use the word fun, but it, it's certainly interesting. Um, it's been nonstop trying to, you know, devote myself to the focus of trying to get all the little nuts and bolts happening in here and getting bands in here and making sure the food is right. I've never owned a restaurant before, let alone a club, a uh, music club. So it's, um, it's a challenge and it's interesting and I guess it's fun in its own way. I guess it's fun. <laughs> well, tell me where we are and to the uninitiated in the audience, where are we here? We are in about an hour and 15 minutes north of New York City in um, Southern Dutchess County. Uh, and I've lived in the Connecticut and Dutchess County area now since, uh, oh boy, 1979. So it's been a long time I've been around here. So I'm very, very much a part of this, this area. And uh, I've known about this particular venue. It, it, was a, it was sort of a folk music club for years and years. And I always, I used to come down here occasionally and see bands and, and uh, artists. And I always thought, okay, if it, if it ever comes up for grabs, this would be a good place to do it, to do a club. Uh, my style. And also in the meantime, I had the show Live from Daryl's House, which continues now, and I wanted to sort of have a venue that would represent the show uh, the, the, that I'm doing and actually have uh, th the same bands that play on my TV show uh, have them perform here in front of an audience because I usually do my, I, in fact, I always do my TV show without an audience at all. So this allows people to actually see a version of Life from Daryl's House in the, you know, sort of in this physical situation. And it's brand new. It's brand new. I, I did it all myself. Me and my uh, partner, Joe Interland, uh, nuts and bolts, hammers and nails, the whole thing. <laughs> well, let's talk about music for a moment. Okay. Listen, you and John Oates in the Rock Music Hall of Fame, widely considered the, the greatest rock duo in the history of music. And not just because you sold a lot of albums and had hit singles, but because you had real influence and were of importance. Those are facts, but do you think of yourself that way? Well, you know, I, I hate, I hate labels. I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy and proud to be considered considered to be that, that kind of a person or, or that kind of an act, you know? I mean, John and I are, uh, we're unique. I, I really believe that we are truly unique in a lot of ways. Number one, we're unique because even though we're perceived as a duo, we're really two very separate people and we've always worked separately. Very seldom did we really collaborate. Now, when we did collaborate, boy, we had Man Eater and Out of Touch and, and uh, a, a number of other songs that we literally wrote together. But the majority of our songs were written separately and our lives were very separate. We appear together on stage, and other than that, we're very, two very separate people. But having said that, you know, there's something about the duality of us that, I don't know, it's, it's just a unique relationship that's, that really works. We egg each other on, uh, it, it never gets stale, it, it's, it's constantly evolving, and, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, always, it's always something new going on, and, and it's a good thing. You know? it's sort of as one. Yes, it's a duo, but, yeah. uh, but it's one. But you and John have made a point. You want to be known by your name. Yeah. It was always called, you know, from the very beginning, people tried to, you know, truncate it. Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates. We always said, no, it's Daryl Hall and John Oates. You know, it's two people. You know, it, it, it was very, very important to us. And for the reasons I just mentioned, it's very important because we are so separate. And we never wanted to be, I never, I, if you really want to make me angry, say, say uh, you know, uh, uh, treat me like I'm half of something. You know, I'm not half of anything. You know, we're both our own individual entities that, that choose to work together. By the way, did you think in the beginning about the double meaning of Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates, like <laughs> a mule hauling Oates or something? 
<laughs> We've had so many different ones, man. Hauling oats. One time we went into a uh, we went into a place in Texas and they had us booked as Harlan Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get we get them all. We get them all. It's uh, it's a, it's all part of it. I think it's funny. <laughs> well, it's generally known that among musicians as well as television anchor people, yeah. that you have to have a certain ego to do it. <laughs> but down somewhere deep, does it bother you? Does it irritate you? to be considered as two rather than one? That's sort of what I'm saying. I don't like to be half of anything. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a choice we made way back when we were kids. And it's worked for us. It's, uh, it's evolved. It's, uh, our relationship has, has allowed us to be very separate, have separate lives and separate projects. But, uh, you know, if people want to perceive us uh, as a certain thing, they want, we want to be the Hall & Oates thing, yeah, that's okay too. Well, let me get back to some basic questions then. As a musician, who are you? Well, I am a lifer, number one. I, you know, I started as a baby. I come from a musical family. Started as a baby as a musician. I learned uh, my mother was a, a vocal teacher and sang in a band. Uh, my earliest, earliest memories are, 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 are watching bands play and, and uh, um, uh, going on the road, things like that, singing in church, like, you know, I'm a soul singer, I mean, I, I come from Philadelphia, and, uh, or outside of Philadelphia, really, and I came up in a neighborhood where that was the music of my childhood, and so that's, that's very natural to me to do that, so I call myself, you know, I'm a, I, I went to music school, so I'm a trained musician, but I'm a soul singer at the same time, um, songwriter, I don't know, all those things. Is there one piece of music, maybe one tune, one song, when you were a child, when you were coming up, that affected you more than any other? I wouldn't say there's any one song, no. But it, it's, I was, I was really uh, moved in an early time by, uh, as a really young kid, by, by church music, gospel music, and, and, uh, and harmonies. My father was uh, sang in a vocal group, so I was really, really, in, I've always been really into, into harmony and uh, any of those kind of songs. And then, of course, that, that translated into the secular world where I was listening to early uh, doo-wop music and early R&B and, and all these kind of things because it, it's very heavy on the, on the harmony, the same kind of harmony. So it, it's always been things like that. I can't say there's one song, but it's that style of music that, that's always really moved me and interested me. Well, I'm especially interested in the gospel music influence. Any one piece of gospel music, any particular hymn, it stood out in the early going. Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, there's so many. I, I, I you know, I, I was lucky enough. I mean, not to not answer your question, but I was lucky enough to, to work with the, uh, with the Blind Boys. And they came on with my show. Blind about, Boys of Alabama. Of Alabama. Yeah. And when I was about 12, I was crazy about them. I mean, because again, that harmony thing. And uh, I would actually leave leave the church I was in and sit out in the car and and and, and listen to the gospel stations and hear that stuff because I, I liked what was going on in there better than what was going on inside the church. And and the Blind Boys were one of the ones that I was so I was completely nuts about. So to work with them uh, was a I did that was one of those great moments, you know. What has changed the most from let's say the glory days? You're in a glory period now. Repeat. In a different but, way, yeah. But that glory period, say the late 1970s into the 1980s. How has first of all how has the music changed? Well, the music was a little more. Um, complicated, I think that's the right word, um, as was my life then. I mean, what, what we were doing in the 70s, we, we, we always made use of the technology that was available, and at the time that we came up, the act of making music had, was really evolving. In the 70s, I had the first polyphonic synthesizer. Now, what that means is it's the first time where you could actually control the sounds of uh, you know, whatever, you know, you had every sound. Uh, that was possible to make, but you could do it in a polyphonic way as opposed to single notes. That means you could play it like a keyboard, and that that made a big difference in music. Uh, it took it to another place, and then there was all these different things that were coming in in the recording world that we added to our arrangements and even in our writing style, both together and separately. That that. Are, that reflected in our music. So that a lot of the songs happened because of the technology that was around at the time. And I think now, 
that's all passed. That's that that wave has sort of crested, and Excuse now me, that I'm, wave started with the, sort of at the end of disco. As disco was yeah, beginning to fade, it was around that time. Yes, it was that time where it changed from people just playing in a room, a bunch of guys getting in a room or whoever getting in a room and playing music and 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 putting it down on on a tape, and then these things started changing, and you could actually create. A much different sound on your own, and you didn't need the other people really if you didn't want to use them. But now I think we're back to using those things if you want to use them. But I think I personally backed into guys getting a room and playing, you know, so it's sort of come full circle in that respect. How has the music business changed? Well, that's changed. It's again full circle, not in a good way. But uh, when I started out, pretty much, you know, I started out in Philly. On indie labels, you know, they were just they were run by uh, you know one of the big one of the the labels was run by a guy that uh, that had a, a, a clothing store on South Street in Philadelphia, very low budget records, very indie thing, you know what people call indie now. And then as time went on, the music business started trying to control the artists more and more and more and more, and to not a good effect. And you could sort of it, the the music got more corporate and 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 it, it sort of lost a lot of its freedom and then the indie thing reemerged because it almost had to and that sort of t took it, it it was sort of a bridge to take us to more what's happening now where everything's falling apart which is great i love that <laughs> and the internet has changed everything and now uh, if you're uh, i wouldn't sign to a major label you you couldn't pay me enough to sign to a major label because it it why why do that when you have all the freedom to do what you want to do, whether you're a new artist or an established artist like I am? You said, quote, the internet has changed everything. Yeah. Let's expand on that a little. Okay. All the gatekeepers are gone. People, the, the audience controls things. It, what, what people like, no matter whether it's old, it could be a 50-year-old song or an older, or, or it could be a song that's just been created yesterday. Um, it's all the same. I mean, I have kids, and that's the way they listen to music. They don't. They don't listen to the radio. They they listen. They pick and choose things, and there's no time involved in it. And and uh, they they just like what they like. And all the labels are going away. And all you know, all the gatekeepers are gone. Rock uh, uh, rock journalism is a bad joke at this point. Uh, record companies are shooting themselves in the foot as we speak. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. They're lost. The, you know, I, I, I'm, I've, uh, I'm in the forefront of, of taking music to the internet. I mean, you know, my show, Life from Daryl's House, was the first show to do this. This is a cable television that, program for those uh, yeah, which, watching. Which is an internet show. It started on the internet. It, and it was uh, eventually explained to the to the to the television world enough that they picked it up and then it became a television show as well it's a real internet show you know and that's the new world as far as i'm concerned but you smiled a moment ago when you spoke of it you said you love it i've spoken to any number of musicians who are clearly fearful of this new world hey if you're a fearful person or if you're not thinking you know you have to roll with it man it's you know it's a new world and if you try and fight that it's like you're gonna lose it's, that's the way it is. I see my own generation trying to hold on to things that are unholdable and uh, too bad for them. Could a young musician, say the 15-year-old Daryl Hall, could he make it today? Yes. Yeah. Because if they had, if they thought like I did, they'd be Daryl, right? They, they would figure out how to do it. They'd figure out how to go around and get to where they needed to go. Now, uh, yeah, I'd say yes. And what advice would you give that aspiring, ambitious, pretty good musician who's 14, 15 years old and who dreams of being a Daryl Hall? Oddly enough, I would say the same thing I always would have said, and that is get a band together and, and get a tribe. You know, play. Play live. Play live. Get people to really like you. Expand your tribe. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. And be very, very focused. Have good people around you. Don't get screwed up by people who want to take pieces of you and you know and and, and di dilute you or whatever be pure uh, be tough and learn your craft you mentioned before quote the philadelphia sound what is the philadelphia sound you know philadelphia is probably one of the most southernmost of northern cities it's and 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 it it's 
demographic uh, was, you know, English and German and Irish and Italian and, and a, a lot of black influences all coming together. And the sound really does reflect that. It's uh, Afro-European sound, you know, and um, there's, there's different sort of different subsets of that, you know, there's, there's a, you know, what, what Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff and Tommy Bell did was, uh, and I was part of that in the beginning, and they, they created a sound, and a lot of people in the world think, okay, that's the sound of Philadelphia, like, uh, like a few other regions in the United States, it has a very distinct thing going on. And there are subsets within that distinction, mm -hmm. and yours is one. Yep. Uh, I've heard the phrase, and if this offends you, then you tell me, but it's not my phrase, the phrase, Blue-eyed blues. <laughs> yep, it, it, you're you're not offending by by saying it, but I, I find that term naive, it, because it's not it's not about white and black. American music is a combination of 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 all kinds of influences, and you, you can't racially divide it. You can't say blue-eyed soul or brown-eyed opera. You can't do it. It's, it's impossible, and you could try, but it but it's just a silly label, and uh, it, it just it is irrelevant. What were the principal influences on you? Let's say the Temptations. Yeah, I was, again, this Philly guy and, and, and the Temptations and people like the Temptations came into town and I, there was a place um, like the Apollo Theater in New York, but there was one called the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. And I was pretty much a regular there and I got to meet all the bands. I got the Smokey Robinson and I mean, I'm talking, I was 18 years old and uh, Curtis Mayfield and you name it, everybody. They were all coming in and out of town. And I would be backstage and I, you know, and hang, and literally hanging out with them. And I became friends with the Temptations. I would get them coffee and carry their stuff around, you know, and all that stuff. And, um, I, you know, and, and they were a big influence on me personally and, and, um, and, and musically. But in driving here today, I listened to some of the Temptations music, mm -hmm. I listened to some of your music, and I thought that even I, completely unschooled and uninitiated could hear the progression from the temptations into your yeah. own music. What you'll hear especially is it's heavy on the vocal harmony. That's what I was talking about before. And it all came from church singing. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's gospel music. That's what the temptations background was. And, uh, and so we shared that and, and yeah, melodically and everything. I mean, I'm a, I'm a child of all that stuff. Now let's talk about your relationship with John Oates. Mm -hmm. Where did you meet him? How did that come about? How did the two of you got together? I met John. I was promoting my first single. I had a band, I had a group called the Temp Tones. And the we temp were tones. Temp Tones. Not because of the Temptations, because we were going to Temple University. And because uh, everybody thinks it's the Temptations. So it was a vocal group, and uh, we, had a, we had a single uh, that we were promoting around the Philadelphia area. And we were doing uh, uh, one of those things where you'd go, it was, it was a complete R&B crowd and everybody would lip sync their song. And John had a single, and I didn't know him at the time, and he was also there to promote his single. So we were waiting backstage, and some fight broke out or whatever, and the whole show just went to pieces and was canceled. <laughs> and um, we, were on a, we were on a second floor, and we went down in a lift together in an elevator, and I said hello to John. I said, hey, how you doing? And that was it. And I found out he was, he was also a freshman at Temple, and, uh, so then we, we started talking and we realized, of course, we like the same kind of music and uh, we started sharing apartments together because we were both, our parents lived out, out of town and we didn't want to be on campus. So we became sort of college roommates, playing songs together, in and out of bands together, uh, again, working very much separately as well. And then after college was over is when we decided to try writing songs together and beat Daryl and John. So uh, you graduated from college, you did graduate. Actually, I didn't. I, I quit six weeks before graduation. Wow. I know. It was one of those weird things. I, I, I was a part of it, I was a music major, and part of the, in those days, uh, part of the requirement to get your degree was with student teaching and doing all these things. And I was, I was doing that. I was student teaching at a junior high school and playing in a, in a bar band at night to try and make money and also because that's what I did, you know? And my supervisor got me in her room and she said, look, you have to make your choice. You're either gonna be a, you're either gonna be a teacher or you're gonna be a live musician and you can't do both because, it, you know, you can't uh, work till four o'clock in the morning and then get up and teach kids at eight o'clock. 
it's your choice. I said, okay, you really want me to make that choice? And I walked out of the room. <laughs> and that was it. And that was the end of your degree? That was it. Now, John, did he graduate? He did graduate. He was a, a journalism major. Journalism All right, so major. you graduate, and, but you stay together. Uh -huh. You're writing songs, you're performing together? Yep. We were doing just around the Philadelphia area. We're, we, we decided to literally be just a songwriting duo. And I had a man, I picked up a mandolin. I don't know why, but I did. And, and I had a world sur piano. And John had his acoustic guitar. And we would just play either songs we'd written separately or together, uh, just the two of us. And we'd play these little places, coffee houses, and you know, 75 seat places, whatever. Now, your early albums weren't a success. Certainly not by the standards of what became your standard later on. Mm -hmm. When and how was the breakthrough? Well, it took us time. The first record we made uh, with Atlantic Records, it was sort of all these songs we had compiled. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was a grab bag of things that we had been writing since we were all through college. And it was, you know, it was all over the place. So I, I understand why that record didn't do anything. We didn't have any singles on it or whatever. And then we had a band, The Luncheonette, which was very successful, but it sort of had a funny slow burn success. We didn't have any big single when the album was actually released, even though She's Gone was on, on the band Luncheonette. And people talk about that album still as b being what they consider one of our best albums. But it didn't have that obvious single, or maybe the world wasn't ready for us at the time. Who knows why? You know, you, these things are strange. And it took a couple of years after that album was released to re-release She's Gone and have that song be a hit, hit song. But uh, it was, uh, we were allowed, to, you were allowed to experiment and allowed to fail, actually, in those days. It was good. It was a good time to be creative because you could, you could do really what you felt and you didn't have that pressure of, oh man, no singles in that, okay, drop them, that's, that's the next, right. bring the next band on, you know. It was a little more loose. But you do break through. Yeah. And you begin to have one hit album after another. Mm. Hit singles all over the place. You're having enormous success. You're making a lot of money. Uh, we were making money. I don't know how much we were keeping, but we were making it. <laughs> right. well, that's where the question was going. What happened to that money? You got me. Ask other people, man. Uh, the, I'm, I don't love the music business. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing. The uh, business. You love the music, but not the business. Exactly. I've always had an adversarial relationship with the music business. Um, it, you know, a lot of uh, strange things happen in the music business. I don't even call it a business. It's. I mean, I, I hate to say this. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. I mean, music business I, I, is more... It, to me, it's, it's closer to organized crime than it is to a business because it's based on exploitation and thievery. Um, even at its best, it is. You know, the, the, the artist is always the one that gets the, 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 the scraps. And uh, that's just the way it's always been. And um, you don't really make... The truth is, I found, is you don't really make that much money from the actual records. You make the money from playing live. and. That's where my income has always, you know, we've, we've been live musicians for years and years. Fair to say it's one reason you still do it. That is one reason I do it. Well, I'm interested in this. I envisioned you and John each getting checks for a million dollars every other week or once a month or well, every three months. If we did, I didn't see that million, you know. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the money was, I don't know. I, it's, it's hard, it's really hard for me to talk about this because I don't want to, I don't know. but. It wasn't handled very well it was by by other people, and, and and I blame if I if I had put any blame on anybody, I put the blame on John and I for not paying more attention to things in those days. Now we've changed considerably, but um, you know we didn't know what we were doing. Well, during this period, late '70s and the '80s, you're having hit records, concerts are sold out everywhere. Did you fall into drugs? No. Whiskey? Um, I did some drinking, but nothing. I, I've, I've always been a pretty controlled person. I, I, I don't like drugs. I mean, I, I won't say I never took drugs, but I, I, don't, um, I don't like them. They don't agree with me, and nor did with John either. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're still coherent, and here we are, you know. Um, I, it just never had really that much appeal to me. Women? Oh, yeah. No. Yeah, of course. It almost... <laughs> Almost a question doesn't have to be asked. If you're in rock and roll, 
that's going to be part of it. Yeah. Well, you, sex, drugs, and rock and roll just drop the drugs out and you got it, you know. <laughs> I'm going to go back to some of the, the hit tunes and how, how they came to be. And the list is so long we can't possibly go through <laughs> the whole list. Yay. But let's just go through it. Um, Rich Girl. Rich Girl was a song that came out of a, um, my uh, companion, long-term companion, Sarah Allen, had a um, college boyfriend. And he was a, you know, I, 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 I exaggerate things a lot. It was actually, you know, he was perfectly fine. But he came from a fairly wealthy background. It was a he, but the song is uh -huh, uh -huh. Rich Girl. So he, he left, and I said, I sat down at the piano and went, he's a rich guy, and he's gone too far. And then I went, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> so I changed it. <laughs> That was our. That was the first, the first number one hit. Kiss on my list. Kiss on my list is is I wrote with Sarah Allen's sister Jana. It was really the first time we ever sat down to try and write a song. She was only about 20 years old, 21 years old, and uh, uh, I sort of was trying to write it for her because she was thinking maybe she wanted to cut a record or something, and we we. Made up "Kiss on My List." It was uh, we just it just happened. So that was a real collaboration between Jan and myself. And uh, the weird thing about it is that I played it for people, and they said, "Oh, well, you you got it. Put that out." And I went, "Okay, should I recut it?" And they said, "No, it sounds great the way it is." That was just the demo that we did, a four-track demo, using this really silly uh, um, um, drum machine. But I guess the simplicity of it. And something about it, it just really worked, and a lot of people liked it. Fair to say that cemented your reputation as a popular act on the climb up? Yeah, I think that that song and that album, uh, was the album was called Voices. That was the first album that John and I had self-produced with our band. And I think that really changed things. There was, that was a, a, a big change in, in the way John and I made music. Man Eater. Man Eater was a song that uh, John came up with the original chorus of that song, which was uh, not uncommon for him to come up with an, a chorus idea and then I would expand on it. Excuse and, me, for those who don't know the music, how does the chorus go? Oh, here she come. Watch out, boy. She'll chew you up. Oh, here she come. Then he went, he's a man eater and a da 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 da. And I went, no, no, forget that da 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 bit. <laughs> Here she come that way, you know. And I said, no, I, I, for whatever reasons, I said, why don't we just, no, let's let's make it more like a Motown kind of feel. So I put that other beat to it, mm, uh, oh, 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 uh, that way. And that's that's how you hear the song now, as as opposed to a reggae song. Well, that didn't work out all that badly. I, he he's not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> did they come to you? You come to them? How did that work? The first day, it was one of those simultaneous situations. We we had a video and they needed videos because they didn't know what they were doing. It was really interesting, MTV in those days, because it was not unlike the way, uh, the, the sort of early internet days, it was, it was pioneer times, you know, things were happening. It was seat of the pants stuff, you know, uh, like the early days of television or whatever. I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of that kind of thing, and I, and I and I like to watch things in their beginnings, and and I was there for that. Uh, and I mean, they would give us, they'd say, well, we got four hours to fill. Why don't you guys be VJs and say, oh yeah, by the way, here's a Duran Duran video or whatever, you know? And and that's how it was, and it was it was really fun. Uh, MTV was really cool. Did you think at the time, this is going to be big and we're going to ride it? Yes, I did. I could tell immediately that this was, I mean, it, but the result was immediate, so it wasn't that hard to figure out. It was perfect for its time, perfect for the generation that wanted to watch music as well as hear it, and uh, it was just the right place at the right time, and it, I could feel it. I could, I could feel it in the air. Did your concert business skyrocket upward after that? Yeah, because absolutely. Everything changed. I mean, it was... We were right at uh, the forefront of all that, and, and one of the most played video artists. We were VJs on there. We, we pretty much, we were helping to run that channel, really. In the mid-80s, one could argue, at the very peak of your popularity, you and John, in effect, walked away from it. We didn't, I wouldn't say we walked away, but what we did was we paused. Uh, I felt and I, I won't say I felt, John, John felt it too. It was, there was a, we had sort of been at the center of the eye of this hurricane, and it's, it had a real feeling of 
culmination. That culmination being the, the We Are the World Live Aid, which happened in 1985. Then at the exact same time, within weeks of that, we had done this, uh, in, in, compared to that, this was a minor thing, but it was significant to us. We reopened the Apollo Theater in New York City with The Temptations. We, what year? About 1985? 1985-86, yeah, yeah. And so it wasn't a separation. It was just that we, we wanted to scramble things up. But I think that as far as the, if you want to look at it from an audience standpoint, it, it, we definitely were up here in 1985. And then the, the late 80s, it was sort of going down this way. And I think in the 90s, we were sort of in a, in a, in a trough. Uh, that's how I feel, as far as popular appeal goes. And how'd you get out of the trough? Well, I, I sort of, again, sort of walked away to some degree. John and I always played live, and we'd always come together and, and tour and do things. But I was, I was spent pretty much the entire 90s in England. So when, how, and why did you decide to come back? We had this song called Do It For Love. We had a hit with it. We had a hit with it. So that sort of perked people's eyes, you know, like, oh, wait a minute, there's Daryl and John, you know? We had, and, 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 oh, they're back. Yeah, you know, in those days, radio was still the, the standard you judged everything from. And that sort of gave us another shot in the arm. And then between 2000 and, you know, for, for the next six, seven years or whatever, we were doing a lot of touring and uh, regained our popularity, I think, as a, as a really, as a touring band. And we were f sort of feeling good about all that. You know, it was, it was, we were in a nice place. It was, it was good. We weren't, we weren't being superstars, but we, we had a great following and we were selling out concerts and we were doing just fine. And then I had the idea to do Live from Daryl's House, and that's really another thing altogether. Now, you had that idea, you decided to do it. Was that or was that not your vision of how you could stay in touch with your fan base? It was a lot of things. It was me realizing that you could do it. That was the first thing. I said, okay, I was with my good friend T-Bone, my guitar player, bass player, and we said, why don't we just let's just sit on the porch and play songs and let people hear it and we'll do whatever and that was the concept really as far as it went and then we immediately started expanding upon that and we we had the band and then we said oh why don't we bring guests in and then we had guests and I said well you know we need to eat food because we're at the house and having a party so let's let's bring in guest chefs and it really evolved naturally like that and it clicked with people people loved it and still do and it, 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 I don't know, it, it, there's something about it. It's, 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 a, it's a, sort of this breath of fresh air in a very artificial world of entertainment. We're going to just do whatever happens and let the world see how musicians act when they're just hanging out as friends and not worried about anything and there's no audience. So I think that that really appeals to people. And I think that, that is the engine that's generated a whole new perception of not only me, but Hall and Oates, you know. Uh, and opened up whole new worlds for us. You and John will be very much part of the history of American music. I'm starting to believe that now. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to know, to feel that that's real. I realized that, again, with, with Daryl's House, that I had crossed over a generational gap that a lot of people don't do. They, they're part of their generation and they stay with that. And, and I think once you cross a generational gap, it, it, it changes your, uh, the impact you have in, in the world. I guess we are part of history. We'll see to what extent. One could make a case, I'm here to make the case, that this is as a successful period as you've had. And let's face it, you've had a lot of them. <clears throat> the internet program you started has now found a home in, in cable. Mm -hmm. You have your own house restoration program right, right. on cable. Mm -hmm. uh, the music still sells. Mm -hmm. You still tour. Mm -hmm. From where does this determination come? Let's face it, you could clip coupons and live a, <laughs> live a nice, easy, glide life. I don't know. I, I, I just have a very active mind. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. My sister asked me that the other day. She says, where did you get this from? You know, and I, I think I got it from my father. You know, he, he's a, he was a very determined man, and, but very focused person. I learned how to work. I'm a hard, hard worker. I'm not afraid of work. I'm not afraid to take on things. I'm particularly interested in that because some people have the stereotype of musicians not being very hard workers. 
you know, they play and they stay out late and they sleep yeah. late. I like to work. I actually enjoy it. And I, I, and I do agree with you that a lot of people that I've come up with, they don't have my work ethic, that's for sure. I mean, if they, uh, you know, I think a lot of people rely on the, the wind in their sails of their past success, you know, and that just kind of blows them. And, and if that wind is less windy, <laughs> then they slow down, you know, but they don't really have, they don't really have that kind of drive. Or if they did, they've lost it, you know, but I've never lost that drive. In your personal life, from childhood up to now, what's the worst thing that happened to you? The worst thing. One of the worst things. It, it, it's, it's, I mean, uh, getting Lyme disease is no fun. I'll tell you that right now. I'm living with it perfectly fine. But it's, 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 it's a, it, it, be, it became a factor in my life, you know. Because um, Lyme disease, when you have chronic Lyme disease, it, 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 it's, it's there forever. There's no cure for it, at least right now. So it, it, it interferes with things, you know, it, sometimes I have stamina issues and things like that. So I had to change, change my life a little bit because of that. And you got Lyme disease when? Oh, about around, almost the same time as, the, as I started the Daryl's house, uh, 2006, something like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm an outdoorsman. I love the outdoors. I yeah. know about Lyme disease. Yeah. It's nothing you kid about. Nope. People don't understand. I mean, if, if, you, if it goes chronic in you, there is no cure for it right now. And, and you have to maintain it with, with supplements and, and to some degree, and occasionally antibiotics and things like that. It's kind of like having malaria. You have flare-ups and things like that. What's the very best thing that's happened to you? Oh, man. The best thing was having my parents and having my family and learning and be, from the age of zero how to do what I do and having that kind of support. Uh, over the years, which continues to today, you know, uh, my mom's my biggest fan. She comes up to the club. I mean, you know, and my whole family's that way. And and I have I've been very lucky to have people around me that are really good people. You spoke and, very well of your father. He's passed. Yeah, he, yes, this year. Yeah. But how proud your mother must be of you. Oh, very. I'm telling you, she loves it. <laughs> she's she's always saying things to me about it. It's it's great. I'm, I'm, and that makes me happy. <laughs> this has made me happy. You've All been right. terrific. Well, thanks, I appreciate Dave. your time. All right. I appreciate you doing it very much. I, I went to music school, so I'm a trained musician, but I'm a soul singer at the same time. Um, songwriter. I don't know. All those things. Is there one piece of music, maybe one tune, one song, when you were a child, when you were coming up, that affected you more than any other? I wouldn't say there's any one song, no. But it, it's... It, I was... I was really uh, moved in an early time by, uh, as a really young kid, by, by church music, gospel music, and, and, uh, and harmonies. My father was uh, sang in a vocal group, so I was really, really, in, I've always been really into, into harmony, and uh, any of those kind of songs. And then, of course, that, that translated into the secular world, where I was listening to early uh, doo-wop music and early R&B and, and all these kind of things, because it, it, it's very heavy on the, on the harmony, the same kind of harmony. So it, it's always been things like that. I can't say there's one song, but it's that style of music that, that's always really moved me and interested me. Well, I'm especially interested in the gospel music influence. Any one piece of gospel music, any particular hymn that stood out in the early going? Oh, I don't know, man. Oh, there's so many. I, 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 you know, I, I was lucky enough. I mean, not to not answer your question, but I was lucky enough to to work with the uh, with, the, with the Blind Boys. And they came on with my show. Blind about, Boys of Alabama. Of Alabama. Yeah. And when I was about 12, I was crazy about them. I mean, because again, that harmony thing. And uh, I would actually leave leave the church I was in and sit out in the car and and and, and listen to the gospel stations and hear that stuff because I, I liked what was going on in there better than what was going on inside the church. And and the Blind Boys were one of the ones that I was so I was completely nuts about. So to work with them uh, was a uh, I didn't that was one of those great moments, you know. What has changed the most from let's say the glory days? You're in a glory period now. Repeat in a different but, way, yeah. But that glory period, say the late 1970s into the 1980s. How has first of all how has the music changed? Well, the music was a little more. Um, complicated, I think that's the right word, um, as was my life then. I mean, what, what we were doing in the 70s, we, we, we always made use 
of the technology that was available. And at the time that we came up, the act of making music had, was really evolving. In the 70s, I had the first polyphonic synthesizer. Now, what that means is it's the first time where you could actually control the sounds of uh, you know, whatever, you know, you had every sound that, that was possible to make. But you could do it in a polyphonic way as opposed to single notes. That means you could play it like a keyboard. And that, that made a big difference in music. Uh, it took it to another place. And then there was all these different things that were coming in, in the recording world, that we added to our arrangements and even in our writing style, both together and separately, that, sh that, are, that reflected in our music. So a lot of the songs happened because of the technology that was around at the time. And I think now, that's all past. That's that that wave has sort of crested, and Excuse now me, that I'm, wave started with the sort of at the end of disco. As disco was yeah, beginning to fade, it was around that time. Yes, it was that time where it changed from people just playing. That's the way it is. I see my own generation trying to hold on to things that are unholdable, and uh, too bad for them. Could a young musician, say the 15-year-old Daryl Hall, could he make it today? Yes, yeah, because if they had, if they thought like I did, they'd be Daryl, right? They, they would figure out how to do it. They'd figure out how to go around and get to where they needed to go. Now, uh, yeah, I'd say yes. And what advice would you give that aspiring, ambitious, pretty good musician who's 14, 15 years old and who dreams of being a Daryl Hall? Oddly enough, I would say the same thing I always would have said, and that is get a band together and, and get a tribe, you know? Play. Play live. Play live. Get people to really like you. Expand your tribe. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. And be very, very focused. Have good people around you. Don't get screwed up by people who want to take pieces of you and, you know, and, and, and d dilute you or whatever. Be pure. Uh, be tough. And learn your craft. You mentioned before, quote, the Philadelphia Sound. What is the Philadelphia Sound? You know, Philadelphia is probably one of the most southernmost of northern cities. It's and 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 it its demographic uh, was you know English and German and Irish and Italian and, and a, a lot of black influences all coming together, and the sound really does reflect that. It's uh, Afro-European sound, you know, and um, there's there's different. Sort of different subsets of that, you know. There's, there's, a, you know, what what Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff and Tommy Bell did was, uh, and I was part of that in the beginning, and they they created a sound, and a lot of people in the world think, okay, that's the sound of Philadelphia, like, uh, like a few other regions of the United States. It has a very distinct thing going on. And there are subsets within that distinction, mm -hmm. and yours is one. Yep. Uh, I've heard the <coughs> phrase, and if this offends you, then you tell me. But it's not my phrase. The phrase. Blue-eyed blues. <laughs> yep, it, it, you're you're not offending by by saying it, but I, I find that term naive, because it's not it's not about white and black. American music is a combination of 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 all kinds of influences, and you can't racially divide it. You can't say blue-eyed soul or brown-eyed opera. You can't do it. It's, it's impossible. And you could try, but it, but it's just a silly label, and uh, it, it just it is irrelevant. What were the principal influences on you? Let's say the Temptations. Yeah, I was again this Philly guy, and 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 the Temptations and people like the Temptations came into town, and I, there was a place um, like the Apollo Theater in New York, but there was one called the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia, and I was pretty much a regular there, and I got to meet all the bands. I got the Smokey Robinson, and I mean I'm talking when I was 18 years old, and uh, Curtis Mayfield and you name it, everybody. They were all coming in and out of town. And I would be backstage and I, you know, and hang, and literally hanging out with them. And I became friends with The Temptations. I, two very separate people. And we've always worked separately. Very seldom did we really collaborate. Now, when we did collaborate, boy, we had Man Eater and Out of Touch and, and uh, a number of other songs that we literally wrote together. But the majority of our songs were written separately and our lives were very separate. We appear together on stage. And other than that, we're very two very separate people. But having said that, you know, there's something about the duality of us that I don't know. It's it's just a unique relationship that's that really works. We egg each other on. Uh, it it never gets stale. 
it, it's it's constantly evolving and, and uh, uh, yeah, it's it's always it's always something new going on and, and it's a good thing. You know? It's sort of as one. Yes, it's a duo, but, yeah. uh, but it's one. But you and John have made a point. You want to be known by your name. Yeah. It was always called, you know, from the very beginning, people tried to, you know, truncate it. Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates, Hall and Oates. We always said, no, it's Darrell Hall and John Oates. You know, it's two people. You know, it, it, it was very, very important to us. And for the reasons I just mentioned, it's very important because we are so separate. And we never wanted to be, I never, I, if you really want to make me angry, say, say uh, you know, uh, treat me like I'm half of something. You know, I'm not half of anything. You know, we're both our own individual entities that choose to work together. By the way, did you think in the beginning about the double meaning of haul and oats, haul and oats, <laughs> like a mule hauling oats or something? <laughs> We've had so many different ones, man. <laughs> hauling oats. One time we went into a uh, we went into a place in Texas and they had us booked as Harlan and Oaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get we get them all. We get them all. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's all part of it. I think it's funny. <laughs> well, it's generally known that among musicians as well as television anchor people, that yeah. you have to have a certain ego to do it. <laughs> but down somewhere deep, does it bother you? Does it irritate you? to be considered as two rather than one? That's sort of what I'm saying. I don't like to be half of anything. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a choice we made way back when we were kids. And it's worked for us. It's, uh, it's evolved. It's, uh, our relationship has, has allowed us to be very separate, have separate lives and separate projects. But, uh, you know, if people want to perceive us uh, there's a certain thing and they want, we want to be the Hall & Oates thing, yeah, that's okay too. Well, let me get back to some basic questions then. As a musician, who are you? Well, I am a lifer, number one. I, you know, I started as a baby. I come from a musical family. Started as a baby as a musician. I learned, uh, my mother was a, a vocal teacher and sang in a band. Uh, my earliest, earliest memories are, 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 are watching bands play and, and uh, um, going on the road, things like that, singing in church, like, you know, I'm a soul singer, I mean, I, I come from Philadelphia, and, uh, or outside of Philadelphia, really, and I came up in a neighborhood where that was the music of my childhood, and so that's, that's very natural to me to do that, so I call myself, you know, I'm a... Did you restore this place? Yeah, I did. It was really a, a wreck, and, and especially in the interior. I, mean, I yeah, recently met up yeah, with Daryl Hall at the location of his latest passion. Happened. A refurbished restaurant and live music club named, simply enough, Daryl's House. Hall hosts the show from his new club, and as we sat down there to talk, I realized that more than all the fame, Daryl Hall is first and foremost a musician's musician. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this. My pleasure. And I hope it'll be fun for you. Oh, yeah. Have you had any fun lately? Have I had any fun? I, well. If, if you want to call opening this club fun, I don't, I don't know if I'd use the word fun, but it, it's certainly interesting. Um, it's been nonstop trying to, you know, devote myself to the focus of trying to get all the little nuts and bolts happening in here and getting bands in here and making sure the food is right. I've never owned a restaurant before, let alone a club, a uh, music club. So it's, um, it's a challenge and it's interesting and I guess it's fun in its own way. I guess it's fun. <laughs> well, tell me where we are, and to the uninitiated in the audience, where are we here? We are in about an hour and 15 minutes north of New York City in um, southern Dutchess County. Uh, and I've lived in the Connecticut and Dutchess County area now since, uh, oh boy, 1979. So it's been a long time I've been around here. So I'm very, very much a part of this, this area. And uh, I've known about this particular venue. It, it was a, it was sort of a folk music club for years and years, and I was, I used to come down here occasionally and see bands and, and uh, artists. And I always thought, okay, if it ever, if it ever comes up for grabs, this would be a good place to do it, to do a club, uh, my style. And also in the meantime, I had the show live from Daryl's house, which continues now, and. I wanted to sort of have a venue that would represent the show that, that, that I'm doing and actually have uh, the same bands that play on my TV show 
uh, have them perform here in front of an audience because I usually do my, in fact, I always do my TV show without an audience at all. So this allows people to actually see a version of Live from Daryl's House in the, you know, sort of in this physical situation. And it's brand new. It brand new. I, I did it all myself. Me and my uh, partner, Joe Enderland, uh, nuts and bolts, hammers and nails, the whole thing. <laughs> well, let's talk about music for a moment. Okay. Listen, you and John Oates in the Rock Music Hall of Fame, widely considered the, the greatest rock duo in the history of music. And not just because you sold a lot of albums and had hit singles, but because you had real influence and were of importance. Those are facts, but do you think of yourself that way? Well, you know, I, I hate I hate labels. I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy and proud to be considered considered to be that, that kind of a person or, or that kind of an act, you know? I mean, John and I are, uh, we're unique. I, I really believe that we are truly unique in a lot of ways. Number one, we're unique because even though we're perceived as a duo, we're really in a room, a bunch of guys get in a room or whoever, get in a room and playing music and, and, and putting it down on, on a tape. And then these things started changing and you could actually create a much different sound on your own and you didn't need the other people really if you didn't want to use them but now I think we're back to using those things if you want to use them but I think I personally backed into guys getting a room and playing you know so it's sort of come full circle in that respect how has the music business changed well that's changed it's again full circle not in a good way but uh, when I started out pretty much you know I started out in Philly on indie labels, you know, they were just, they were run by, uh, you know, one of the big, uh, one of the, the labels was run by a guy that, uh, that had a, a, a clothing store on South Street in Philadelphia. Very low budget records, very indie thing, you know, what people call indie now. And then as time went on, the music business started trying to control the artist more and more and more and more, and to not a good effect. And you could sort of, it, the, the music got more corporate and, and, and it, it sort of, lost a lot of its freedom and then the indie thing reemerged because it almost had to and that sort of took it, it it was sort of a bridge to take us to more what's happening now where everything's falling apart which is great i love that <laughs> and the internet has changed everything and now uh, if you're, uh, I wouldn't sign to a major label. You you couldn't pay me enough to sign to a major label because it, it why why do that when you have all the freedom to do what you want to do? Whether you're a new artist or an established artist like I am. You said, "quote The internet has changed everything." Yeah. Let's expand on that. A little. Okay. All the gatekeepers are gone. People, the, the audience controls things. It, what, what people like, no matter whether it's old, it could be a 50-year-old song or an older, or, or it could be a song that's just been created yesterday. Um, it's all the same. I mean, I have kids, and that's the way they listen to music. They don't, they don't listen to the radio. They, they listen, they pick and choose things, and there's no time involved in it, and, and uh, they, they just like what they like. And all the labels are going away. And all, you know, all the gatekeepers are gone. Rock, uh, uh, rock journalism is a bad joke at this point. Uh, record companies are shooting themselves in the foot as we speak. Uh, they don't know what they're doing. They're lost. The, you know, I, I, I'm, I've, uh, I'm in the forefront of, of taking music to the internet. I mean, you know, my show, Life from Daryl's House, was the first show to do this. This is a cable television that, program for those uh, yeah, who which, watch it. Which is an internet show. It started on the internet. It, and it was uh, eventually explained to the, to, the, to the television world enough that they picked it up and then it became a television show as well. It's a real internet show, you know, and that's the new world as far as I'm concerned. But you smiled a moment ago when you spoke of it. You said you love it. I've spoken to any number of musicians who are clearly fearful of this new world. Hey, if you're a fearful person or if you're not thinking, you know, you, you have to roll with it, man. It, you know, it, it's a new world and if you try and fight that, it's like you're going to lose.